Ricky Lee Green was considered more dangerous than Ted Bundy by the FBI. Ricky had a brutal childhood. It was full of abuse. His dad and his granddad assaulted him and his siblings almost daily in unimaginable ways. His first marriage would end two months after it began with Ricky holding a knife to his wife's throat and R-wording her in a drunken stupor. She would leave and she would never return. His second wife would help him with his killing spree because she had a sexual fetish for blood. Ricky was suspected of other unsolved killings, but he never admitted to them. Hello and welcome back to Crime, Mystery and Mayhem with Kate. If this is your first visit to my channel, hello, welcome, it's great to have you here. Here on my channel I talk about true crime stories. I find them interesting and I am quite intrigued as to why some people do the horrific things that they do. Like with today's story, this guy, my goodness, com completely insane, honestly. Please remember to like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel because it would really help me in my attempts to grow my channel. I cannot do this without you guys. I need you, I need you. Still not monetized. <laughs> I know, I know, so sad. Anyway, all right, let's jump into today's story. Today I'm gonna to be talking about a serial killer called Ricky Lee Green. Here we go. Ricky Lee Green was born on December the 27th 1960. He was born in Fort Worth, Texas. Ricky was one of several children born to Bill and Jesse Lou Green. Together with his siblings, he was physically abused by his father on an almost daily basis. His dad would actually torture his kids with electroshocks to their bodies. He was a horrible man. He would punish them by punching them in the stomach or he would hold them under water to get them to the point of almost drowning. His dad was so horrible. He was just a really horrible man. He would even aim a BB gun at Ricky when he was only six years old. So Ricky, he would make him, you know, go up on the porch and he would tell his six year old son, I'm gonna count to 10. You've got to the count of 10 before I start shooting. So. Poor little Ricky would be running and his dad would count down from 10. Get 10, start shooting this BB gun at his son. If he got hit, his dad would just say, well, you should have run faster. Disgusting man, doesn't deserve to have children. His dad also poked him and his brother with cattle prods. When Ricky was only two years old, his dad would lock the boys in the closet and he would growl from the other side to scare them. He's horrible. These kids, they did not stand a chance with this man. How can you grow into a decent person when you are tormented and treated like complete shit like they were as kids? I know some people do grow up to be okay after abuse, but come on, it would really mess you up, right? This kind of torment. And obviously the constant abuse at home did have an impact on Ricky because he would go on to commit some really horrific crimes. Ricky was even essayed by his grandfather. So his dad would send him to stay with his grandfather and he would get essayed. This poor child and his siblings were put through way too much, way too young. Ricky could never understand why his dad and his granddad hurt him. These people were supposed to love him, right? Why are they hurting him? At some point during his childhood, Ricky lost use in one eye. So he suffered an accident involving barbed wire, which later um, he had to have his eye replaced with a glass eye. So he attended school up until the eighth grade, and then he dropped out and started working as a radiator repairman. So we're jumping forward now. He's coming into adulthood, well he is pretty much an adult. On February the 18th, 1984, Ricky got married. He married a lady called Mary Francis. 
Ricky felt that she was the closest that he had ever had to a normal family. But apparently their relationship was mainly based solely on sex. Their marriage did start to deteriorate after only two months because Ricky suspected that his wife was sleeping around. She might have been, she might not have been, I do not know. So Ricky was really unhappy in his marriage and with his life in general. He started to drink and he drank a lot. He would actually drive around drunk. He would often go for drives to escape the reality of his life. So one night when Mary got home from work, Ricky was waiting up and he was sitting in the living room. He was heavily intoxicated. So they got into an argument, I'm assuming about infidelity, and he pulled a knife on his wife. Then he proceeded to R-word her viciously. So then when he was done, he continued to drink until he passed out. Mary was actually waiting for him to pass out, and once he did, she grabbed her belongings and she left. Never to return. She got the heck out of there. Good on her. So Ricky woke up and he found that his wife was gone. And he didn't actually care too much. A couple of weeks went by and he met a new woman. He moves on fast. Really fast. That kind of happened to me though. My husband left me and then like three weeks later he was in a new relationship, but we were not going to talk about that today. So this woman, she was a Sharon Dollar and she was just as bad as Ricky. Their first night together was all about sex and booze. So sex and drinking. Sounds like fun, right? But yeah. Only three days later, Sharon actually asked Ricky if he wanted to move in with her. And he was like, yeah, cool. Sounds great. He really liked Sharon and she liked him too. They were perfect for each other. Sarcasm, sarcasm right there. They're not perfect for each other. <laughs> not at all. They thought they were perfect for each other, but in reality, they were really bad for each other. She would actually encourage him to commit crimes against other people. She got off on it. Like, she really got off on it, on people's pain, blood, like, just not good. Although Ricky was happier with Sharon than he was with his wife, and he was actually happier than he'd ever been before in his entire life, his drinking did get worse. He was drinking a lot, too much. Sharon was the same. She drank like a fish as well. So one night while the couple were having hot passionate sex, Sharon pricked Ricky's penis with a needle. So this chick had a thing for blood. Yeah, she liked it, it got, she, she got hot on it. When she did this to Ricky, he got like a bit of a shock, as you would, right? Someone's pricking your, your dick with a needle. And he was like, don't do that, that hurts, but it was too late. She had already started sucking the blood from his penis, which apparently helped to relieve the pain. Yeah. <laughs> Can't say I've tried that one. Well, anyway. Oh my God, I'm starting to blush. Oh my God. Anyway, continuing with the story. So this was the first time that Ricky noticed Sharon's pleasure for blood. So weird. This is some weird shit, honestly. All right, now I'm going to start talking about the crimes. There is a warning here. Uh, I will be talking about SA and mutilation. Just, it's nasty. It's really bad. It's really, really bad. You guys don't want to hear this. Oh my God, click out. No, don't. Well, you can't. But if you don't want to hear about that kind of thing, click out, come back with another case because it is pretty bad. So here we go. It was March 27th, 1985, and Ricky was about to take his first victim. So the first victim of Ricky's was a teenager. This was a 16-year-old boy called Jeffrey Davis. Ricky had actually met Javis, Javis, da words, Jeffrey, before, and he invited him out to, you know, hang out, chill out. His wife was away, so he's going to hang out with a teenager, as you do, I guess. Okay, so Jeffrey was like, okay, and the two had some drinks and they went for a, a bit of a drive. So Ricky made a stop to go to the toilet and when he returned, apparently he found Jeffrey in the passenger seat masturbating. Remember, this is what Ricky said. We do not know if it is entirely true, if there's, you know, it might be, we do not know. 
So apparently Jeffrey asked Ricky if he'd like to touch him, if you know what I mean. And apparently Ricky got mad and he started beating him up. So he's beating up this kid. Then they continued to drive. So he's driving around. Uh, Jeffrey's complaining because he's in pain. And this dickhead Ricky just kept on beating him up. So he's driving and hitting this kid. So the more that this kid was complaining, the more Ricky hit him. Until finally he pulled over. So he pulls over to a secluded area. And he goes around, opens up Jeffrey's door and drags him out of the car. That's when he proceeded to beat the 16 year old boy viciously. Then he pulled out a knife. Ricky then started mutilating Jeffrey with this knife to the point where he had killed this poor child. Then he proceeded to cut off this kid's penis and he tossed it into a nearby lake. Like that is so unnecessary. Come on, man. Did you have to do that? Or just don't kill people, but you know, unnecessary. So then he disposed of his body in a secluded area nearby. Oh my God, this guy. So Jeffrey was nearly decapitated. He was mutilated and he was castrated. He was just chucked out like he was rubbish. Like this guy did not care. So he was found in the next April in a swamp near the Fort Worth Nature Center and Refuge. Then on September the 20th, 1980, Ricky and Sharon, they got married. They decided that they wanted a victim to have some sexual fun with. So their next victim was for their sexual pleasure of the now Mr. and Mrs. Ricky. So Ricky was driving around, as per usual, he's always driving around and he spotted a hitchhiker. He's looking at this woman. He's like, yeah, I think I'm going to make you my next victim. So he decides pull over and he offered her a ride. So the woman, she sticks her head in the window. She introduces herself. She says, hey, I'm Montana. And he's like, going to ride? And she's like, yeah. And she jumps in and off they go. So on the way, Ricky was like, hey, do you want to um, stop at my place, take a shower, you know, clean yourself up, blah, blah, blah. And she was like, yeah, okay, sounds that sounds nice. So they went back to his house. Montana went inside and she went to the shower. So she's in the shower and Ricky, he like walks into the bathroom and he opens up the shower curtain while this girl's in there. And he was like, can I join you? And she was like, okay. But remember, this is Ricky's account of how it went. So we don't know if this is exactly how it went, but this is what he's saying. He's saying she's having a shower. He opens the curtain. He's like, can I join you? And she's like, sure. So he gets in the shower. Apparently the two of them have sex and then they get out of the shower and they continue into the bedroom, have some sex in there. And then they, you know, finish up what they're up, what they're doing. And he was like, hey, I got to go pick up my wife from work. And Montana was like, oh, OK, <laughs> like you have a wife. So anyway, uh, they get into the car. She goes with them and they go to pick up Sharon. So when he arrived to pick up his wife, she was surprised to see that there was a woman in the car. Any other wife would be like, what the fudge? Like, they wouldn't just be like, oh, they'd be like, who the f is, he, is she? Like, come on. But Sharon was just like, OK. Anyway, so she gets in the car and when they got back to the house, Ricky asked Sharon if she, you know, wanted to have a threesome with this, with this girl, this woman. And Sharon was like, sure. So apparently they all, all three of them agree and they go into the bedroom. So Sharon she takes off all her clothes and she appears naked in the doorway. That's when Montana changed her mind. She was like, no, thank you. I don't want to be a part of this anymore. She's freaked out. It's like, nah, she wasn't keen. But the problem was it wasn't really up to her. Sharon and Ricky had already decided that this was happening, whether she wanted it or not, it was happening. Montana started to realize in that moment that something was very, very wrong. She needed to get the heck out of there. But yeah, she couldn't because Ricky and Sharon grabbed her and they tied her to the bed. So Montana is kicking. She's screaming. She's trying to get away. She's terrified. She doesn't know what they're going to do to her. Are they just going to essay her? Is it going to be worse? What's going to happen? So the two, the two of them, they soon got tired 
of Montana kicking and screaming and they decided to drag her into the bathroom. That's where Ricky essayed her. Then Sharon went to the kitchen and she grabbed a knife. As you do, right? So without warning, Sharon lunged at Montana with this knife and she stabbed her with force. Then Ricky decided he wanted part of that. He's going to get involved. He's going to, you know, do some of this. And he went into the bedroom and grabbed his pocket knife. When he returned, he saw that Montana was trying to get up. She was trying to get away. She was scared. And that's when he stabbed her over and over again. Ricky again, he went to get a large hammer. He wasn't finished with this overkill. He came back with the hammer and he proceeded to bash Montana's head in three or four times. Blood was everywhere. It was a mess. Sorry about the glasses. Like, I need to get my glasses tightened. Oh my God, I keep, grr. Anyway, so apparently Sharon wanted to get involved in this. She was like, you know, this looks like fun. And she grabs the hammer and she starts to hit Montana in the head. This poor girl, she died. And they just stood there looking at what they had done with pleasure. Horrible people. So with the dead body of Montana laying there on the floor, blood all up the walls, all on the floor, everywhere, all over them, Ricky decides he's going to lean over and start to fondle with his wife's breasts. Yeah, because that's a good time for this, right? So the pair, they were super turned on by this, this gruesome scene. Then, because these two are complete freaking sickos, Sharon and Ricky had sex in the blood of their victim because they're disgusting. Afterwards, they proceeded to clean the bathroom and they loaded Montana's body into the trunk of their vehicle. They took her to a secluded area and they dumped her body like she was trash. Then, their next victim. Yeah, there's another one. So the next victim was Sandra Bailey. She was a topless dancer that he, Ricky had met in a club that he went to quite a bit. So he, he picked her up, they must have arranged it, and then they drove to his house where his wife was waiting. So they got to his house and when Sandra saw Ricky's wife, she said that she wanted to go home. I don't think she was aware that there was a wife or that she would be there or, yeah. But, like Montana, leaving was not an option. They grabbed Sandra, Ricky and Sharon, and they tied her up. They then proceeded to carry out the same scenario that they did with Montana. Sandra was stabbed 30 times and she was bludgeoned with the same hammer. Apparently the only difference this time around was that the sex was not as good as it was the first timer, like, okay. That's what they were saying. Um, after they finished beating, R-wording, mutilating this woman, they took her dead body and they disposed of it in the same sort of fashion that they did with Montana. Her nude body was left in a drainage culvert near Henrietta where it was later found on December the 2nd. Then, Ricky's final victim, We'll say this. They say there's more, but yeah. So Ricky, uh, he attacked a man called Stephen Pfefferman. He'd actually met Stephen in a parking lot that was a popular hangout spot for gay men. They got a chatting and the flirting and apparently Ricky's gay. <laughs> I don't think he's gay. I think it was just, you know, he was, he was doing this to get this guy. So uh, Ricky agreed to go back to Stephen's house, you know, for some, apparently it was his birthday and he wanted some casual sex for his birthday. And when they arrived at his house, Stephen started to fondle Ricky in the living room. Then Stephen excused himself to go and take a shower. When he returned, he found that Ricky was in the bedroom. He was like, oh yeah, cool. Birthday sex, yay. Ricky asked Stephen if he could tie him up and they would take turns at tying each other up, you know, bondage kind of thing. Stephen was like, yeah, sounds like some kinky fun, you know, harmless, it's totally fine. 
So Ricky proceeded to tie up Stephen. And then he pulled out a knife. And he started to tell Stephen that he hated homosexuals. Stephen was freaking out. He was scared. He was terrified. What the hell was going on? They were literally flirting a minute ago. Then Ricky, he started to stab Stephen all over his body. He was in a frenzy. He was stabbing over and over. But even with all of these injuries, Stephen was still alive. He was a fighter. This guy, he was really fighting for his life. That annoyed Ricky. So Ricky decided that he needed a bigger blade and he went into the kitchen and he grabbed one of Stephen's kitchen knives. He came back and he stabbed Stephen in his throat. You would think that would kill him, right? No, he's still alive. So he's doing all this. He's repeating the stabs over and over again. He's yelling at him, I hate homosexuals. Then he proceeded to cut open Stephen's body from sternum to scrotum. Stephen's still alive while all of this is going on. He was scared. He's in agony. He is gasping for air. Then, as Ricky's last horrific blow, oh, he's so gross, he decided that he was going to cut off Stephen's penis and he shoved it in his mouth to shut him up. Ricky then rifled through Stephen's things, taking some money and fleeing the scene. He's, he actually stole Stephen's car. Stephen obviously was dead now. He finally succumbed to his injuries. His body was found the next day at his home, bound to the bed and just completely mutilated. Ricky, he went home, he told his wife what he'd done. This time he was, he was a bit upset and Sharon calmed him down and told him that everything was going to be fine, you know, it's, it's all good, it's okay, chill out. So their marriage started to go downhill from here. They both started to drink even more than they were before, if that's humanly possible, but apparently they were drinking more. So they're, they're overdoing it with the, with the alcohol and also they, they're doing drugs. So they started doing drugs. A few years would actually go by. Um, they reckon that they didn't kill anyone in that time, but I don't know. Sharon just started to grow tired of her husband and one day she packed her things and she left. Ricky, he never really heard much from Sharon after that. So she ended up divorcing her husband and she went to a drug addiction counsellor to get some help for her addiction. She wanted to get off the stuff. Over time, she, she got real comfortable with this counsellor and she started talking about her life, her husband, um, and she confessed that her ex-husband had killed multiple people in horrific ways. So the counsellor told her that she needed to go to the police and on the counsellor's advice, she did. She went and she informed local police about her husband's crimes. Then on April the 27th, 1989, Ricky's house was surrounded by police and they arrested him. So he was arrested for capital murder for the death of Stephen. Ricky knew the day would come, but you know, he didn't think it would be at the hands of his wife, the woman he loved. So Ricky was sentenced to death by lethal injection for the death of Stephen and he also got three life sentences, one for each murder. Sharon, she only got 10 years probation for her part. Yeah, it's completely disgusting. She was involved as well. So while Ricky was held in jail on a $1.25 million bond, he confessed to the murders and he was questioned in other murders that had occurred in the Fort Worth area. He denied it, uh, but they do have his trademark. So it looks like he did kill more than just these people. So during the investigation, authorities were told by Sharon and Bill Ricky's dad about a mysterious mattress so allegedly it was covered in blood so a potential fifth victim they they don't know but yeah so they reckon that it was stored in his dad's storage unit or something like that 
It's according to them. And according to them, Ricky had invited an unknown man to his mobile home in 1984, 1985, apparently stabbed him during sex, and then he dropped off this guy at the hospital. So while this lead was investigated, whether it was verified or not remains unclear. So over the next two months, Ricky gave detailed confessions to four killings and said that he never forced his ex-wife to help and that she was a very willing participant. Apparently, Sharon told the police that she was forced to participate in these crimes. And apparently, Ricky told her, you know, keep quiet. She said that she was scared that he might kill her as well. I don't know. What do you guys think? Let me know. Then in June of 1989, Ricky went on a hunger strike. So he started to protest that there were horrible conditions in the prison. But I mean, come on, it's prison. It's not meant to be a nice place. You're, it's a punishment. <laughs> you're there because you're being punished. It's not meant to be a holiday. Prison is meant to suck. It's meant to make you not want to go to prison. So don't do dumb shit. Then in February of 1990, Sharon Green was found guilty in two of the killings. But as part of a plea bargain, she was sentenced to 10 years probation. Which is so stupid. Honestly, it's ridiculous. Come on. Ricky went to court and he was found guilty of capital murder by the jury. So apparently his only reaction when he was read the verdict was that he was not surprised about the outcome. No, I don't think any of us are surprised about the outcome. So due to a heavy media coverage of the trial, the venue was actually moved to Austin. During the penalty phase, in spite of Ricky Green's attorney's demands, prosecutors informed the jury about the other pending charges against the defendant. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So his defense introduced testimony about Bill Green's abuse of his children, and apparently this was the main drive for his son's actions and family members they were actually divided by how they felt about this whole situation so yeah the judge had to actually warn them that they would be imprisoned for contempt if there were any more disruptions apparently this family was they were quite rowdy remember i'm just reading off I'm just not reading. I'm just saying what I've read. All right. So then on September the 22nd, 1990, after deliberating for less than an hour on this case, Ricky Lee Green was sentenced to death for the killing of Stephen Featherman. And he was later given a life sentence for the other killings. His death sentence was automatically appealed to a federal court in Fort Worth, which granted him a stay of execution in 1994 basically until all of his appeals were properly reviewed by the state. Eventually, all of his appeals were rejected, and on October the 8th, 1997, Ricky was executed by lethal injection at the Huntsville unit. It's, a, it's difficult because it's like, I feel sorry for him because of his childhood, but then I like he did these really horrible, horrible things. So I'm allowed to feel sorry for him as like a child Ricky, but an adult Ricky sucks. Anyway, so his, has, his last meal consisted of five scrambled eggs, four sausage patties, eight slices of toast, six slices of bacon, and four pints of milk. My goodness, that is a lot of food. I'm pretty sure like when we die, we void our bowels, right? I read that somewhere that when we die, we void our bowels. So I, I, if it's true, I feel sorry for whoever had to clean that mess up. Anyway, apparently in a break of procedure, the prison officials had to use only a single needle instead of the customary two because they were having a real hard time finding a suitable vein to inject this, you know, stuff into to kill him. Apparently it was because of his long time drug addiction. So in his final statement, he expressed gratitude to God, his friends and fellow death row inmates. He apologized to his victims relatives and said that his death wasn't going to solve anything. His ex okay, so his exact words were, I want to thank the Lord for giving me this opportunity to get to know him. He has shown me a lot and he has changed me in the last two months. 
I have been in prison for eight and a half, or not, yeah, eight and a half years, and I've been on death row for seven. And I have not got into any trouble. Yes, you have, because you tried to do that hunger strike. So you did. But anyway, I feel like I am not a threat to society anymore. I feel like my punishment is over, but my friends are now being punished. I thank the Lord for all he has done for me. So before Ricky was put to death, he quietly and slowly turned to the relatives of his victims and he told them that he was sorry. So he, he said, this to me is another killing and it's not going to solve nothing. Well, it kind of is because it's getting you off the planet because, you know, you do horrific shit to people, you know, just saying. The executioners, like I said, they had trouble finding a suitable vein because Ricky was so fond of drugs, but they, they found it. And before dying, the convicted killer reminded onlookers that he had been a model prisoner while on death row. Not true. He protested. He went on a hunger strike. That is not being a model prisoner. Anyway, Fort Worth Police Detective Danny LaRue asked Ricky at the time of his arrest why he killed these people. And Ricky said they all deserved it. They were kind of dregs of society. So Danny believes eight other unsolved murders are linked to Ricky, but it's likely we'll, we'll never know for sure. Ricky Lee Green, he was 36 when he died. He was pronounced dead at 6.31 p.m. Central Daylight Time, seven minutes after a dose of lethal drugs were released into his right arm. Apparently the hardest part of the whole case was in court when the horrific pictures were shown to everybody. I mean, like talking about these horrific crimes can be super challenging for me at times. So I can only imagine how these you know, people in court felt seeing these horrific photos. Apparently some of the jurors, they actually had to leave the room to throw up or they just need to get away from the pictures and the information that they were given. I'm actually quite shocked that people do this kind of thing and they like doing this kind of thing to people. It's, it's just so weird to see people not only kill, you know, a woman together with their partner but like enjoy it and then have sex it's it's gross it's terrible like there were so many morbid and gory aspects that you can't help but question how people actually enjoy taking part in these horrific crimes i just don't understand it i try to like figure out like why people behave the way they the way they do but i just i don't understand it it's hard to believe that there are people out there like ricky who actually commit these horrible murders and enjoy it and then have sex in someone's blood. It's, it's also hard to believe that Sharon didn't go to jail. Like, honestly, she literally committed these crimes with him. It's just, yeah. I reckon there are more victims. I do. I feel like there are more victims because they reckon they took a break for two or three years, but I don't think so. Apparently, Ricky Green also admitted that he had killed 15 other people. So he told somebody that he killed 15 people and that he believed that he was doing the country a favor by killing whores and homosexuals. But we don't know if that's actually true. It's just something that I read. It's possibly true because, you know, it could be true. It could be true. Are there, it's possible. It's highly possible. Okay, so that is the story of Ricky. And oh my God, how do you guys feel about the fact that Sharon didn't go to prison. I feel like, come on, 10, 10 years of probation. That's a bit of a, you know, just a slap on the wrist. Probation is easy. I know, I know because I've had to do probation before. I, I was naughty in my twenties. Don't ask me what I did. <laughs> I didn't do anything really bad. Just like nothing like theft or anything. I, I had a, I, I was an alcoholic. Um, so I did stuff that, yeah, wasn't so great. Anyway, probation is not that bad. Do some community work, whatever. Go see your probation officer once a week, that kind of thing. Like, unless you got like intensive probation, but it said nothing about like a home detention or anything like that. But I don't know. So 
What do you guys think about that? Do you think Sharon should have gone to jail? Of course. <laughs> she lunged at these women with this knife and then she had sex in their blood. She did say that uh, Ricky forced her, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure about that. I feel like she was just like, I need to save myself. So I'm going to put my husband in it. It's possible. Oh, so I was also, when I was um, researching this case, I, I went online and I typed in, you know, his name and stuff. And this video came up of this other YouTube channel. And they, I literally watched this yesterday. It was, it was interesting. So they went to, I can't remember the guy's name. Oh my God. Is it Jason or Jordan? Something like that. Anyway, um, I watched it and they went to Ricky's grave and they had like um, the little spirit box thing and stuff like that and they were like talking to Ricky's spirit and I don't know, I don't know if I believe it but I, I thought it was pretty cool to watch. So Ricky looking at his grave in this video that this other YouTuber did, um, he was buried next to his brother and his brother died young and then their dad's also buried there so it was like they were asking ricky like you know how do you feel that your dad's buried like right here after what he done to you guys but yeah maybe have a look at it guys because it's kind of interesting i'm i think i'm going to subscribe to their channel <laughs> yeah i think i'm going to subscribe to their channel because i watched their other video um they went to this rock in texas apparently like an alien spaceship <laughs> I sound like a crazy person. Oh my god. An alien spaceship like crash landed there and that they reckon that the alien was buried under this rock and rah, 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 rah. I don't know. If I, what do you guys think? Do you believe in spirits? I think I'm open to it. I think I'm open to it. My son um, actually got me open to that whole thing. I don't know how I just started talking about this, but anyway. Um, yeah, so my my son, he's, he's actually three tomorrow. It's his birthday tomorrow. I've worn all these dinosaur things, but anyway. Um, yeah, so we are in the lounge room and my son looks up like, you know, like he's looking up at someone who's about six feet tall and he was like, oh, the ghost. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? Anyway, I spoke to a clairvoyant um, and they said that my granddad was in my home and that he's here like watching over us and whatnot. But the stuff that she told me, it was like it's there's no way she would have known you know what I mean like I don't know what do you guys think do you believe in that stuff I think I'm open to it I'm open to it especially like my son being like oh and okay so my granddad he died before I had my son and my son's never actually I've never like talked about my granddad with him because I it was really hard for me when my granddad died um yeah it really affected me it was horrible and um yeah so my son i've never spoken about granddad with him anyway so i i found a picture of my granddad like around the close to the time that he died and i showed my son and my son goes grandpa and i was like yeah and he's like grandpa here i was like what <laughs> oh is he the ghost <laughs> But he said, um, then my son goes, people. And I was like, what does that mean? Like, is granddad with people? But yeah, so apparently granddad's in my house. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, now I'm rambling. I feel kind of like nervous now because it's like, oh, is granddad in my house? No, he won't hurt me. But yeah. Mm. But this clairvoyant knew stuff. Like she knew that my grandma is a complete bitch and that she said oh your um your granddad is saying that he's shocked and he's hurt by the way your grandmother is you know acting and at the moment it's like the hell how do you know <laughs> that she's being a crazy lady anyway okay so ricky lee green one very messed up man very very and he died like quite young he you know he could have had a life of, i don't know him and Sharon, eh? Sharon, Sharon, Sharon. No jail time for you. I feel like people go to jail for a lot worse than what she did. And she got nothing, basically. Anyway, what do you guys think? What do you guys think about this case? 
I had actually never heard of Ricky before so uh, it was quite interesting reading about it and then I read that the FBI considered him more dangerous than Ted Bundy. It was like what? Because Ted Bundy was pretty freaking dangerous. And I was like oh, okay and I because I'm real interested in you know Ted Bundy's case. It's interesting but anyway okay so I'm gonna leave it there today. I hope you guys are having a wonderful morning, day, night, whatever it is where you are. If you've got any case suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, I hope you guys have a fantastic day. It's my son's birthday tomorrow. Be sure to wish him a happy birthday. It'll be great. Um, oh my God, he's going to be three. 